thank you for uh, joining this session. Today we are going to discuss the convergence of blockchain with AI and IoT. Uh, at Enchain, I'm Alessio Pagani. Uh, I am research director at Enchain. At, at Enchain, we have a program called Emerging Technologies, where we merge uh, new technologies or old technologies that are gaining traction with blockchain technology. And the goal is to try to find some benefits and find the challenges as well in trying to promote how those te technologies together can work and do something useful. Uh, to discuss this, I have uh, five guests with me. So I'll ask you to pr uh, pr uh, please briefly introduce yourself. So we start with Latif. So uh, Latif Ladi, the founder and uh, president of the IP6 forum. Daniel? Yeah, so Daniel Demers, um, I'm also part of Singular Group. I think yesterday on the venture capital panel was a colleague of mine, uh, Patrick Suter. I'm um, also part of Singular, and we work a lot on blockchain and AI uh, and IoT and smart cities. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Satya? Oh, yeah. Namaste from India. <laughs> I'm Satya Gupta. I chair Bharat IPv6 Forum as well as Blockchain for Productivity Forum in India. In addition, I also run a startup called Connecting the Unconnected. It is a, a village Wi-Fi project covering all country, actually. And for that, I'll be explaining in the question hour. Thank you. Michael? Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Michael Elliott, I'm the CEO of Oversee. Uh, we are a software company and what we do is we create safer, smarter spaces. And we use IoT to discover um, dynamic risk behaviours in properties in order to be able to look at reducing losses for insurers. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking about that later on. Thank you. Ralph? I'm Ralph Wallace. I'm uh program director at Aptive Resources, and I'm the IPv6 lead for the company. Uh, also currently the contract lead for our IPv6 transition support, the Department of Veterans Affairs in the United States. And also I just found out recently that I, I've been designated as the chair of the U.S. IPv6 Council. Thank you, Latif. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a general question, just to hear your thoughts. So since the title is why blockchain will be the backbone of AI and Internet of Things, what are your thoughts on that? So, so first of all, uh, we have to break this, um, uh, you know, this uh, thing of uh, Internet of Things. It was coined by Kevin Ashton when he was marketing director of, of the uh, MIT lab, so RFID lab. And at that time, RFID did not have any IPv IP stack, so it cannot be connected to the Internet until today, so RFID are not connectable to the internet. So coining RFID as Internet of Things <coughs> is absolute uh, incorrect. Uh, so you need to have proper equipment for this. So you need to have smart IoT that connect to the internet. So, so shortly, we are now, if we want to do a blockchain with it, we need to have peer-to-peer -peer IoT, which means that you have to have smart IoT devices in order to do that. I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, I'd like to, to give an example. If you think of a drone highway, you know, which is part of IoT and, and uh, many smart city visions, um, the blockchain is, is mission critical because these, these uh, autonomous drones powered by AI will um, lead their own lives. They need to power up, they need to find charging stations. So blockchain can be, you know, number one, a means of payment, micropayments. It has adds significantly to the security because we spoke also about, or will speak about security. And then thirdly, it is of course also helps identify, you know, which drone is now flying where on that highway. So these are already three massive use cases that without blockchain, you would end up with a database that can, of course, be hacked much easier. Thank you. Satya? Uh, yeah, yeah, taking clue from my earlier colleagues, actually, according to me, blockchain to be called or to become backbone of IoT, it has to solve some problem which IoT have. Uh, to my mind, two problems come immediately. One is that of security and other is that of trust actually. So, and blockchain is actually tailor-made to solve these two problems. And in addition to that, it is not just the backbone. According to me, it should become the communication platform 
uh, in association with IPv6, of course, to solve all the problems of uh, IoT, and especially it should uh, give what I will like to call trust as a service to the IoT network and application and use cases. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I think, um, I think IoT has, has changed so much now. I think anything that spits out data could be called IoT, but we don't have at the moment any kind of infrastructure that we can trust that will provide that data to us in a way that we can act on it. So, for instance, I mentioned insurance uh, recently. There was a, a big hype about insure tech companies um, and doing lots of great things but they very quickly realized that they couldn't scale any of it because there was no infrastructure that they trusted between one insurance company to a reinsurer to a broker in order for, for, for it to go. So I think for me that, that there's that still that missing piece that blockchain can fulfill. Thank you. Ralph? Blockchain allows the data integrity so that when an IoT device needs to get information back to a certain place, it's guaranteed. And data integrity is it's hugely important, not just for IoT, but also for artificial intelligence. Because as artificial intelligence, if the data is bad or inaccurate or inauthentic, your AI is going to be artificial stupidity. So going back to Latif, so you are an expert on IoT devices and IPv6. And we know we expect more than 30 billion devices connected by 2030. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, what, uh, how can blockchain technology enhance the security and privacy of IoT devices and networks in general? And what is the role of IPv6 in this process? Okay. <clears throat> so, so basically, since we are going now to peer-to-peer -to -peer IoT, which means that uh, each device has its own IPv6 address, and the IPv6 address has to be and are totally independent from the ISP. In this case, we need to have what is called uh, provider independent addressing. And, um, and these devices are going to talk to each other. So this is things to things. And nobody in between. And the devices talk to each other in order to generate some decision-making information back to us. And uh, the next level is to secure it, in this case, with blockchain. So you will have an absolute peer-to-peer, V6-based, smart IoT devices, totally independent and secured with blockchain. Right? Yeah. Daniel, I know you work on some uh, smart city projects, and I want to, well, would like to ask you, how can these smart city projects uh, enable a new wave of tech adoption, and what is the role of IoT, uh, what is the role that they are playing uh, IoT and AI in this? Yeah, Alessio, so um, <clears throat> we had the pleasure to work on probably one of the most ambitious smart city projects in the world. Uh, as a European, I'm, I'm a bit sorry to, come to see that in, in Europe we don't have these kind of ambitious projects running, like for example, Neom in Saudi Arabia, which is really pushing the edge. And the moment you try to implement such a vision, um, all these exponential technologies, be it AI, be it blockchain, uh, but then also all these different devices that you want to deploy there um, have to be you know, really at the latest, latest edge of technology. Uh, and this in itself is a challenge, but then having all these elements to interact with each other, that is massively big challenge. Uh, think of just the, the amount of data that needs to be, you know, stored and made available in real time. At the same time, uh, and maybe the last two years have taught us this lesson, at least in Switzerland, you know, the, the lowest layer of any tech stack is actually an, a functioning energy, right? I mean, if you, if you pull the plug and have to rely on, on battery power, you know, sooner or later they will have to charge somewhere. So it's a very complex, multifaceted tech stack that you have to build up. And of course, as a, as a blockchainer, it is my firm belief that that layer, that trust layer, as you could call it, it plays an adamant role because without it, the whole thing is, is very vulnerable, uh, very inconsistent and can be attacked at any point in time. Thank you. Satya, uh, in your opinion, what are the challenges of implementing blockchain in IoT systems? And then I know you, you are one of the top experts in India. So I was wondering if there is any initiative there or any program to include blockchain and IoT together. 
Oh yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, as far as challenge is concerned, I personally don't feel there is a challenge. Actually, blockchain as a technology is searching for the problem or use cases. That is what. So, and we have already identified the problem of a IoT network. Uh, like trust deficit and security and these peer-to-peer -peer communication. So along with IPv6, uh, it can really uh, solve the problem, whatever we have related to this. As far as the initiative, actually we have a great initiative which is backed by our Honorable Prime Minister. It is called PM Wani, the Prime Minister Wi-Fi Access Network Interface. Under that, actually, the 20 million Wi-Fi hotspots have to be created in next two years in the country, especially to cover the rural population. And my own start of connecting the unconnected is a part of that. So in that, what I, I personally proposed there, which is under consideration, is a concept like you have DAFI concept in finance, in blockchain. There is a concept called DAVI, the decentralized Wi-Fi. And that concept actually 10 years back, it was tried in London itself, but that time blockchain was not there in its maturity and it failed actually. After that people forgot. So I was going through the literature, then I found it's a great thing where blockchain can help. And that is what, so what we will do is we'll create blockchain as a platform there, which will actually connect all the Wi-Fi hotspots, there'll be 20 million, all the service providers which brings the connection activity, all the users, app provider, all will come to that platform in the form of this DY, decentralized Wi-Fi uh, network. And that will enable the interoperability, interoperability open roaming between Wi-Fi and just you buy the, let us say, subscription from one hotspot and get uh, registered with that, then you will be permitted to roam around, like what, what in the finance we have a similar thing called UPI actually. So the Wi-Fi, actually blockchain will become the UPI or the microfinance, what they call, of Wi-Fi. So that is the initiative and we are working on that. It's a work in progress actually. And we are learning from the failure of uh, DY in London that was 10 years back. Thank you. It seems a really interesting project. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I know you are an industry expert. So I wanted to know if there is any real use case examples where IoT and blockchain combined uh, could make a difference in industry. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the changes are going to be seismic, quite frankly, and particularly, as I mentioned earlier, with, with insurance. <clears throat> I mean, we're not far away here in London from where underwriters still, with a pen, work out what you're going to pay for your risk, right? So, you know, when you look at insurance, we've probably all purchased insurance at some point in time. And if it's house insurance, they ask you questions such as, what is your house made of? Have you had a flood in the last couple of years? Um, have you got a dog that's gonna, gonna kind of mess the place up? So the insurers know static risks. So they can put a price on a static risk, but they have absolutely no view of a dynamic risk. So I'm gonna give you an example of what, that, what I mean by that. Some of you will have, will have flown here today. Heathrow Airport, it's a big airport here for us, employs something like 70,000 people. But that 70,000 people, only 3,000 actually work for the airport. Everybody else is a contractor working for somebody else in that one building. Therefore, how does an insurer, where do they start in understanding and pricing risk? And that's what insurers do. So the dynamic risk of all of the things that have to happen to keep us safe, to keep planes flying, are all outsourced to plethoras of different companies. And this is where IoT is going to be a game changer. But it will only happen when the insurers and the operators can trust the information that's coming through to us, and then we can then start pricing dynamically. The first real use case that some of us will have seen here is teenagers. So teenagers now that get their first car pretty much have to have a telematic box in that car that will then directly look at the risk profile of that individual as they're driving. That's the first example of where the actual user has an impact on the price that they're paying for that insurance, and that's all through IoT. 
Thank you. Ralph, we discussed a lot about IoT and IPv6, so maybe we can discuss a bit more about AI. What are your thoughts about AI and how can AI be combined with blockchain? The, the thing about most people don't understand that what is artificial intelligence? And especially when they look at me, is, are you artificial? <laughs> and, uh, sorry, just a joke. Sorry, joke. So uh, the, the point, though, is it's all about data, right? Artificial intelligence says, okay, let's start comparing all the data. And so the, comparing the data statistically, and then you start putting it into the model, statistical model. But the, if the data is wrong or inauthentic or late, what, pick whatever you want, your AI result, it's garbage in and it's garbage out. You can say it's AI, but just because it says it's AI, you better not believe it. So with blockchain, if you're gonna get data from one point to another point, establish your authoritative data source, then your AI can get to that authoritative data source and you have authentic, real-time results. That's what the algorithms are doing within the AI. So that's one of the things where you might hear some people, I think Latif and I were talking about chat GBT uh, <laughs> earlier, and uh, I'm not saying that it's good, bad, or indifferent, but uh, <laughs> the, the deal there is, what's the data? What data are they using? And how many times have we come up with Google, we've Googled something, and you go, that ah, doesn't look right. So artificial intelligence and data, blockchain enables artificial intelligence so that you know the data is authentic. Yeah, and I think also in mm -hmm. terms of regulations, right? If we want to trust an AI in the future to drive our car or to take decisions for us, this will be regulated. And so we need to see the sources of the data. Yeah, and it, so, if, so that's one of the things to show me. I'm, I'm one of those guys that says, okay, thank you very much. You just explained everything to me, but show me. And I'm serious, what is the authoritative data source? Back when I was in the Navy, I was in naval intelligence, and no, that's not an oxymoron. The uh, thing with naval intelligence was that we had databases and we had data correlation engines. I was the guy doing the training, trained the trainers on how to use this stuff. And all of a sudden, we're getting ambiguities. Well, why were we getting ambiguities? Because the database had data elements. They had USS George Washington, or USS G Washington, or USS Washington. Every data element, it's different. So you had to look at it to resolve the ambiguities to then reformat the database. What do you think AI is doing? I was doing it manually. AI now is taking a look at it and saying, okay, this is what should be. Here's the percentage of verifiability. Okay, thank you guys. <coughs> Another question for all of you. So since we're here, we have a, a business audience. Uh, what are the key considerations for organizations or businesses that are looking to adopt blockchain and maybe combine it with IoT and AI technologies? <clears throat> maybe I should ask you this question, no? <laughs> <laughs> you could, but I am the moderator, so... <laughs> no, no, I insist. You have already deployed IPv6 with blockchain. Can you tell us your experience? Because no, no, this, this is, this is <laughs> No? <laughs> Oh. That's very important. You have already made a very good presentation and you had a good paper. No, no, no basically, you. <laughs> um, you know, down the road, uh, you know, we have to look at uh, the next five years and what these three things combined, what they can bring to us. And it's quite clear, we know that IPv6 fixes the internet of, uh, of today. So we have 50% of the world uh, internet population using IPv6 without knowing it. Then obviously, you know, uh, Blockchain is on the way of larger scale deployment, uh, so, so we, have, we have to standardize it. Uh, we have to. Yeah, that's one of the important things, right? Standardize yes. of the process. Yeah, correct. So we, we have to get everyone on board, so at least uh, show certain guidance. So we need to have best practices uh, for the industry and, and some, uh, some guidelines how to do that properly, combining all these three monsters. So IPv6, uh, blockchain, as well as AI. AI is going to be more important at the beginning for data analytics, uh, for IoT data that you collect. Uh, so because uh, currently, currently uh, the, let's say big data is, is very confusing because you have to wait until you analyze the data and you know, time passes and decision making actually is already obsolete. While with IoT you will have immediate decision making 
that you can yeah. correct whatever is happening to your crops or whatever. So, so some, uh, some low-hanging fruits uh, sectors are food supply chain. I guess the supply chain today is quite broken and it has impact on inflation and pricing and so on and so forth. Uh, so the war, we, are not, we cannot you know, uh, uh, protect ourselves uh, from war. So, but it's hitting us directly as well. So there are many, many open issues uh, that we need to have new technologies in order to cater for all these uh, this disasters. Could lead to the creation of maybe digital twins yeah. that we can use to analyze. At the beginning, you need disasters. Then we react. So we, okay. we're not very good Let's at that. Let's start planning. with the disasters then. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, what are your thoughts? What are your. I mean, look, with, with, uh, so I spent 20 years in strategy consulting predominantly for clients that were either large corporates or governments or government-enabled projects with large corporates. And, and the lessons learned from that is um, in all these new topics, we tend sometimes to overemphasize on the technology aspect, but fundamentally any IoT vision, any vision of smart city or smart mobility is something that will be driven top down. And we're talking proper governance, we're talking decision cycles, and we're talking regulation. And these are very complex topics that we haven't solved for AI yet. We haven't solved them at the government level in many places for, for blockchain yet, uh, and nor for smart cities. And I think this will probably be the biggest challenge of the coming um, 10, 20 years. You know, how, how will these projects be driven? How will they be governed? How does the regulation fit in? Because all the examples here given are, are spot on, right? We have, we have a huge amount of data. I mean, just a newly created amount of data, it's going to rise exponentially over the coming 10 years. And, and the bad news here is for us humans, like 95% of that data will be machine-generated data. And you can't even ask even the brightest smartest data scientists to, well, have a look at the data and tell me whether it's okay, because it's going to be so much, we will need AI to do that for us, and then we just trust that it's going to be good. So there's all these challenges coming up. I'm personally very excited about that, because it will really shift the gear, also how we move forward as, as humans, um, but it's also full of challenges, and, and some projects will fail, and hopefully many will thrive. Satya? Yeah, let me go back to my proposal of this uh, communication platform as a blockchain uh, uh, solution. So basically it is all about the interplay of various technologies. Blockchain is just one of them and now they are getting married to IPv6 also. In addition to that, two more technologies and one is this uh, 5G and uh, fourth is AI. So 5G, AI, IPv6, blockchain, they all have to interplay together, work together and provide a solution, like I mentioned, trust as a service, or blockchain as a service, or any solution as a service, anything as a service, kind of thing. These four interplay, and for that, as far as IoT is concerned, IoT is basically starts with the sensor, which is generating the data. And then there are so many other devices for connectivity and IoT gateway. So what should happen is all the smart devices in the IoT domain should become a part of the blockchain platform, and they should be called blockchain things like we have Internet of Things. The sensors only should be there in the Internet of Things. Everything else, and which is smart, should become a part of a new concept, should come blockchain thing, like blockchain solution, blockchain thing, and they should. So if all these can be put together as a bundled solution, as any, like uh, this kind of combination should say, I have the solution, you just tell me the problem. <laughs> Something like that. So I think that is where we should work. For that, of course, we need what is called the capacity building, the training, awareness building, user uh, guidance, user hand-holding, all these things are required. That is the skill building part of it. That is still uh, has to work in parallel, of course. Thank you. Thank Michael, you. what are your suggestions? Um, <clears throat> I think for me, you know, there's a lot of terminologies that we're, that we're using, sort of IPv6 and blockchain and when you get out into the, into the real world of um, sort of business, they're interested in one thing, which is cost optimization. How are you going to save me money? Right? And I think this, as soon as we start to really pinpoint and show where the money is, the technology, will, the technology issue will disappear. 
It's, it's, the money is the first objective of showing where you're going to make those savings, especially at a time when we've come out of COVID and people now finally have decided we will now consider digital transformation, but they want to know what the end goal is going to be, how, what's my return going to be, and when we can start really pinpointing that, then the tech will fly. I have to say something about that. I really do. So um, I was the IPv6 transition manager for a very, very, very large federal agency uh, for nine years. So one of the things that I had to do in order to do an IPv6 transition is we had to do data discovery. Data discovery is what have you got and what can be IPv6 today? So one of the things that I was doing in data discovery is exactly what this fine gentleman just right next to me was talking about. Show me the money. What's the value of an IPv6 transition? So I had executives and executives going, Ralph, so what? Why are, why are we doing this? So understanding CapEx and OpEx and understanding that once you've deployed IPv6, we got lessons learned from Facebook and LinkedIn and Time Warner and Wells Fargo and Google and Microsoft, but we got lessons learned. And what happened is that these people that already went to IPv6, I'll get to the IoT and AI in a minute. When, we get, when you get to IPv6, you reduce the administrative overhead, you reduce infrastructure, which means that you, you reduce the amount of millions of dollars of licenses. You don't need middleware anymore because you've taken everything down from a layer seven down to a layer three applications and network stuff. Uh, so you're dealing with all these things, but people all of a sudden go, oh, wait a minute. So you're telling me you're going to save me millions of dollars in infrastructure costs? Yes. Can you prove it? Yes. So in that data discovery, right, for CapEx, OpEx, that's great. So here I am going through this agency, and uh, we're going, okay, so what's networked? How many people use their key cards to get into their rooms? right? Or key cards to get into a building, right? You know those are IoT devices. And most of them are networked. I don't know if you knew that or not. So, so that key card in order to get into the building, I don't care what kind of building it is, whether it's federal, state, local, your hotel room, doesn't matter. It's networked. So the question there is that how well can you establish a IPv6 network of IoT to support that entrance? And how well can you manage it with the data with using blockchain to say, Joe Smith just entered room 207? Yeah. We have one minute or a bit more left. I have one last question so for whoever wants to ask it, to reply to it. Um, I mean, we, are, we agree that AI and IoT can, be, uh, can benef benefit from blockchain. I think this was part of the discussion, but what do we still need to accelerate the adoption? Or what can we do as researchers in <coughs> blockchain or experts in blockchain to facilitate the adoption uh, for the businesses? Yeah, that'll be very quick, uh, 15 seconds. So we want to empower everyone, and we want to empower also the devices to be smart, to do for us. This is a major innovation that creates a lot of opportunities, as well as um, creates new business uh, uh, opportunities and open up, you know, take many things that are so manual, that are very important to us, into digitizing them so that we can exploit them and reduce the cost uh, of deploying many things. Supply chain is an example. Yeah. So, so it's a very important step that we are going, going into and we should, should go for it, uh, you know, regardless uh, of whatever issues that we have on this planet. So. Anyone wants to ask? I'll, I'll use up the, the, the final 30 seconds. <laughs> I think it's, it's education. While I agree that uh, the general leadership needs to focus on CapEx and OpEx and these things, um, I think it's dangerous if they're not tech savvy enough. And I personally uh, embarked on, on the Academy of, of the Bitcoin Association and, and I learned a lot. And I think this is something that actually every C-level 
should do because it's very dangerous if you just trust that yeah do we have the blockchain implemented yeah yeah sure we got some blockchain inside i mean which maybe, blockchain? <laughs> maybe it's a zero knowledge optimistic roll up which already has the optimism in the name i mean we need to have some level of of understanding at the top else i see big risks in in all the implementations that's going to come in that area can i dub table up uh, dub, dub let me get on to you just for a second organizational change management is the major blockage of any technology insertion, <laughs> right? Yeah. And he, look at this, and look at everybody else going, yep, organizational change management. That one person that says, well, it ain't broke, why do we have to fix it? So, so on that organizational change management, you gotta get your stakeholders to buy in. How do you get stakeholders to buy in? The gentleman right there nailed it. You get them educated, you get them involved, and then, and then whether it's a business or a technical discussion, you get them to buy in. As soon as you get the buy-in, you've removed that obstacle to your technology insertion. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.